Okay, so continuing in chapter eight, we are going to talk about something called electrolytes. So let's define electrolytes again and talk a little bit more about water and what water does with these different chemicals. So aqueous solutions, So remember, aqueous, AQ, means that water is the solvent. Remember that water is polar. So back from 161, you should remember that water is polar. And when we look at the Lewis structure, the electron pair geometry, and the molecular geometry, let's just review that quickly. So water looks like this. So the Lewis structure of water, how many valence electrons do we have? So we have two hydrogens that has one valence electron and then we have one oxygen that has six valence electrons. That is eight electrons. So remember we draw the central atom and then we draw the elements connected to the central atom, connect them with single bonds, so that's two, four, so now these other electrons are gonna go here, six, eight. So this is the Lewis structure of water. The Lewis structure really just tells us how things are connected in a compound or molecule, but it doesn't tell us much about its function, its properties, or its shape. So for that, we would need to look at the molecular geometry. So remember from the Lewis structure, then we can go to the electron pair geometry. Remember the electron pair geometry just cares about the regions of electrons around the central atom. It doesn't care if a region is a lone pair of electrons or a bond. So the steric number, the number of regions of electrons around that central atom is four. That means water is tetrahedral. Again, this doesn't really tell us much, everything about water. We really need to look at the molecular geometry. So the molecular geometry is different depending on how many of these regions are lone pairs and how many of these regions are bonds. So if this water has two regions that are lone pairs and two regions that are bonds, that means the molecular geometry of this molecule is bent. So if you were to draw what this molecule actually looks like, it would look like this with two lone pairs up here. So because we know the shape of the molecule, we can now also see that this is a polar molecule. So remember, um, we would assign a charge to a molecule. So polarity has to do with the separation of charge, the difference in electronegativities between the elements, also the shape of the molecule to see if you're gonna have what's called a net dipole or not. So remember, we could say that this part of the molecule is partially positive because hydrogen is less electronegative, and this part of the molecule would be more electronegative, would be more partially negative because oxygen is more electronegative. And also, if we were gonna draw vectors, you draw the vectors pointing toward the more electronegative element. The sum of these two vectors would be in this direction. We would say that this is a polar molecule because it has a net dipole. So all of this to understand what things water, what things will dissolve or be soluble in water, and what things will not. And that's where we're headed in all of this, but we kind of need to remember some of the properties of water before we get into that. So there's two types of substances that we'll be talking about. We'll be talking about ionic compounds, and we'll be talking about covalent molecules. So ionic compounds are charged. Ionic compounds will ionize in polar solvents like water. 
if you put an ionic compound in water, it is soluble because of the ion dipole interactions. So remember that when we talked about intermolecular forces um, back also in the first part of general chemistry. Um, <clears throat> so for example, an ionic compound like sodium chloride is gonna break apart into its ions, Na plus and Cl minus. These ions would be aqueous because this salt, which is an ionic compound, remember salts are just another name for ionic compounds, is soluble because these charged ions are going to interact with the partial negative and the partial positive parts of water. So ionic compounds are they will ionize in polar solvents. We'll also see that we're gonna call this, that they are soluble in polar solvents. We're gonna to get to that a little bit later. Covalent molecules, because there's no charge, um, they will not break apart. So ionic compounds will break apart and another word for breaking apart is ionize, break apart into its ions. You also might hear this called dissociate, um, and covalent molecules will not. So this leads us to the two classes of molecules that we're gonna talk about, which are electrolytes and non-electrolytes. electrolytes and non-electrolytes. So an electrolyte is something, something that will ionize in water because it is ionic. Um, there are two types of electrolytes. There are strong electrolytes and weak electrolytes. The difference between a strong electrolyte and a weak electrolyte is that a strong electrolyte will ionize completely. A weak electrolyte will ionize partially. This is actually something called equilibrium, which we'll talk about for many weeks when we're in the last quarter of general chemistry. So not something we need to worry about right now, other than you should be able to tell me the difference between a strong electrolyte and a weak electrolyte, just by definition. That strong electrolytes ionize completely, weak electrolytes ionize partially, they would be ionic because they would be soluble in water. Um, here is an example of a strong electrolyte, we said up here, NaCl, NaCl is gonna break apart into Na plus plus Cl minus. That would be an example of a strong electrolyte. An example of a weak electrolyte would be um, a weak acid. And um, a pretty common weak acid is something called acetic acid. This is what's in vinegar. And you do not need to know the name or compound. Um, but what happens is when you put acetic acid in water, instead of it breaking apart completely, it's gonna break apart partially. And we indicate this by showing this double-sided arrow. And what this double-sided arrow represents is that this reaction is not going all the way to the product side. So if you put acetic acid with water, some of it will break apart into what's called the acetate ion and this, which is called the hydronium ion, and some of it is gonna stay together as acetic acid. This is called partial ionization. This is an example of a weak electrolyte. This is also an acid, which we are gonna talk about acids in a little bit, um, so we will come back to this. Um, Non-electrolytes, Non-electrolytes do not break apart at all. So I'm just gonna say no ionization. <clears throat> 
it doesn't break apart at all. So that's the difference between electrolytes and non-electrolytes. It's will this break apart into its ions in water. Water is polar, ionic things ionize in polar substances because of the ion-dipole interaction. So that's what you need to know about electrolytes versus non-electrolytes. Let's talk about acids and bases while we're here. So acids and bases would be example of electrolytes that are breaking apart. Um, let's see. So let's just define what an acid and a base is. And then we'll spend a lot more time on this later. So an acid is defined as a compound that when is dissolved in water will produce the hydronium ion. which we call hydronium ion. So in biology, you might hear this called an acid is something that when dissolved in water will produce the hydrogen ion. The hydronium ion and the hydrogen ion essentially represent the same thing. Um, this hydrogen ion doesn't really exist in water because if you put this hydrogen ion in water, it would join an H2O and just form this H3O+. So really both of these are correct. In chemistry, the one that makes the most sense is to talk about the hydronium ion, H3O+. Um, so that's what I'll use. But if you've learned this in biology or in another science class, it's the same thing. This is just what is actually happening in this system. The hydrogen is joining a water. We call that hydronium. So let's define what a base is. A base is a compound that when is dissolved in water will accept either a hydrogen or a hydronium. So acids produce hydrogen or hydronium. Bases accept. So that's the difference between an acid and a base, and we'll look at this in a lot more detail later. But just while we start talking about solutions and aqueous reactions, this is one that we're going to see. So acids will produce, another word that you might hear instead of produce is donate, and bases will accept. But the difference in acid and base chemistry is really just the transfer of a hydrogen. Acids donate them, bases accept them.